Hello. Today I'm going to discuss about cell death. This is the next part of my cell injury video. If you haven't watched that video, please watch it first. So that this video would make more sense. As we know, when a normal cell undergoes irreversible injury, it losses its normal functions and becomes a dead cell. There are two types of cell death. Necrosis and apoptosis. Necrosis is a mechanism of cell death, which occurs in living tissue. And it is always a result of a pathological condition. Common causes of necrosis include the following. Ischemia. Pathogens like bacteria, viruses, fungi, toxins, and inflammation. In necrosis, the plasma membranes of cells get disrupted and cellular content leak out. The body recognizes these elements as potential injurious agents and launches an acute inflammatory response at the site of necrosis. This inflammatory response is essential to lay the foundation of healing process. In necrosis, cellular changes after cell death do not become visible immediately. It takes about 1 to 3 hours to appear the earliest changes visible by the electron microscope and 4 to 6 hours by the light microscope. Therefore, in a patient who had died from a myocardial infarction, the cellular changes after myocardial cell death do not become visible immediately. However, as the cellular contents leak out in necrosis, cardiac-specific enzymes may present in the blood within one hour after the infarction. Here is a diagram of the morphological changes in nuclear digestion during necrosis. In the leftmost side, you can see a normal cell with a normal nucleus. In the next one, the chromatin clump together and nucleus becomes shrunken. This is called pycnosis. Pycnotic nucleus is smaller compared to a normal cell. Then the pycnotic nucleus breaks into small fragments due to the activity of the endonucleases. This is called chirurexis. Finally, endonucleases further act on the remaining fragments and completely digest the nucleus. This is called karyolysis. Cytoplasm of the necrotic cell looks deeply eosinophilic with H and E stain. This is due to protein denaturation and loss of ribosomes. Because, denatured proteins love to bind eosin. And ribosomal RNA love to bind hematoxylin. And loss of ribosomes cause reduction in binding of hematoxylin. Due to the loss of glycogen particles, cytoplasm gets a homogeneous appearance. And cytoplasm becomes baculated. Myelin figures, which are derived from damaged cell membranes accumulate within the cytoplasm. They are either phagocytous or degraded into fatty acids ultimately. These fatty acids may combine with calcium ions and form calcium soaps. So eventually the necrotic cell becomes calcified. By the electron microscope, the necrotic cells can be seen with discontinuous plasma and organelle membranes. This is an image from Robin's textbook of pathology. In the first stage, the cell undergoes reversible injury. At this stage, if T injurious agent is removed, the cell can get back to its normal state. But with progressive injury, the cell undergoes necrosis. Look for the characteristic features we discussed above. Once a cell dies by necrosis, the next step is to get rid of the dead tissue. This occurs by two mechanisms. Autolysis and heterolysis. In autolysis, necrotic cells are digested by their own enzymes. This is due to the leakage of enzymes during necrosis. It is rapid in tissue which contain large amount of such enzymes, like pancreas and gastric mucosa. Intermediate in tissues like heart, kidney and liver. Delayed in tissues like fibrous tissue and connective tissue. In heterolysis, the digestive enzymes are secreted by other cells, like neutrophils and macrophages. Now let's discuss about the different types of tissue necrosis. There are two major types. Coagulative necrosis and liquefactive necrosis. In addition, there are other special types as well. They are caseous necrosis, fat necrosis, fibrinoid necrosis, and gangrene. First let's discuss about coagulative necrosis. In coagulative necrosis, digestion of necrotic cells by autolysis is inadequate and proper digestion occurs by heterolysis. Therefore, dead cells retain their outlines for several days and the organelles disappear slowly. Therefore, the stages of nuclear digestion are usually observable. Coagulative necrosis is commonly seen in solid organs like heart, kidney, liver and adrenals. Typical injurious agent is hypoxia. In addition, non-hypoxic coagulative necrosis can be seen in burns and in viral hepatitis. The mechanism of coagulative necrosis is as follows. 
injurious agents like hypoxia, reduces the activity of aerobic glycolysis and increases the activity of anaerobic glycolysis. So as a result, lactic acid tends to accumulate within the cells. This increases the cellular acidity and causes denaturation of intracellular proteins, including lysosomal enzymes. Denaturation of lysosomal enzymes prevents the cells being digested by autolysis. And in case of burns, heat directly causes denaturation of intracellular proteins and leads to death by necrosis. This is an image of coagulative necrosis in renal infarction. This image shows the microscopic appearance of the infarction. You can see the normal cells in left side and coagulative necrosis in right side. The necrotic area looks deeply eosinophilic. And you can see the preserved structural outlines of the cells. Macroscopically, during the initial several hours the necrotic area may appear normal. Then the area shows a mottled appearance due to the seepage of blood into the area from damaged blood vessels. Subsequently, blood gets cleared out, and a few days later the necrotic area looks firm and pale, lined by a rim of hyperemia, due to acute inflammation in the surrounding viable tissue. However, sometimes the necrotic focus could look hemorrhagic, such as necrosis which occurs in already congested tissues like in torsion of testis, and necrosis which occurs in tissues with dual blood supply, like in lung infarctions. This is called hemorrhagic necrosis, a special type of coagulative necrosis. In liquefactive necrosis, the necrotic cells undergo complete digestion, giving rise to a liquid-like material. This process is called liquefaction. This is due to high levels of lysosomal enzymatic activity on dead cells. Liquefaction is seen in tissues rich in lysosomal enzymes, like pancreas. In these situations, removal of dead tissue occurs by autolysis. And liquefaction also seen in situations where suppurative inflammation takes place. Such as in pyogenic bacterial infections. In this instance, removal of dead tissue occurs by heterolysis. First let's discuss about liquefaction due to autolysis. It is seen in conditions like acute pancreatitis and in brain infarctions. In case of pancreatitis, due to high level of enzymes the major digestive method is autolysis. In ischemic necrosis of solid organs, the usual outcome is coagulative necrosis. However, in infarctions of brain and spinal cord, typical outcome is liquefactive necrosis. This is due to the high levels of lysosomal enzymes in glial cells, which also undergo necrosis during the process. In addition, lack of collagenous connective tissue framework in the central nervous system and rich lipid content may also contribute to enhance the fluidity of necrotic material. Liquefaction due to heterolysis occurs in severe bacterial infections evoking a suppurative type acute inflammatory reaction. The neutrophil-rich exudate digests the necrotic cells to form a thick, fluid material in the form of pus. Abscess is the typical example. Macroscopically, necrotic area becomes soft and pulp-like. In case of pus, it has a creamy, yellow-greenish consistency in the center, surrounded by a pyogenic membrane. Microscopically, cellular outlines of dead cells cannot be identified. In pus, there are numerous neutrophils. Now let's come to the special types of necrosis. First one is caseous necrosis. It is a special type of coagulative necrosis, characterized by yellowish crumbling nature of necrotic tissue, similar to the consistency of cottage cheese. Typically occurs in infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis and occasionally in fungal infections. Tissue necrosis is due to a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction evoked by activated macrophages and epithelioid cells. During mycobacterial killing, there is a significant tissue damage. Caseous material contains numerous dead mycobacteria. The caseous consistency is thought to be due to the release of mycolic acid from the damaged cell walls of mycobacteria. Here is an image which shows the microscopic appearance of caseous necrosis. Second one is fat necrosis. It is the necrosis which occurs in adipose tissue. There are two types. Enzymatic fat necrosis and traumatic or non-enzymatic fat necrosis. Enzymatic fat necrosis is commonly seen in acute pancreatitis and other forms of pancreatic injuries, causing fat necrosis in mesenteric and retroperitoneal adipose tissue. Damaged pancreatic assigner cells release phospholipases and lipases eat the surrounding tissues and damage them. Especially the phospholipases damage the cell membranes and cause necrosis of adipocytes and leakage of triglycerides. 
Triglycerides are broken down into free fatty acids by the activity of lipases. These fatty acids combine with calcium ions and form calcium salts. These calcium salts get deposited as chalky white plaques at the sites of necrosis in the peritoneal cavity. In addition, macrophages engulf free triglycerides and become foamy macrophages. Foamy macrophages can fuse together to form Tauten's giant cells. However, these cells are more prominent in traumatic fat necrosis. Non-enzymatic fat necrosis is commonly seen in tissues with high lipid content, such as breast and subcutaneous tissues. Adipocytes get disrupted due to trauma. And triglycerides and lipase are released. Similar to enzymatic fat necrosis, triglycerides get digested into free fatty acids and eventually get deposited as chalky calcium salts. Undigested triglycerides may form lipid pools. Usually there are numerous foamy macrophages and Tauten's giant cells surrounding such lipid pools. This will eventually lead to a chronic inflammatory reaction and gradual fibrous tissue formation. When chronic inflammation is associated with lipid-laden macrophage collections, it is called xanthogranulomatous inflammation. Fibrinoid necrosis is a special form of necrosis usually seen in immune reactions involving blood vessels. It is characterized by deposition of immune complexes along with fibrin, which leaked out from blood vessels, giving rise to a bright pink appearance with H and E stain. Healing of necrotic focus occurs by fibrosis, and this may lead to weakening of the vessel walls. Commonly seen in conditions like polyarteritis nodosa, microscopic polyangitis, Wegener's granulomatosis, and systemic lupus erythematosus. Gangrene is defined as an area of dead tissue in a living person, which is characterized by black discoloration. There are two major types. Wet gangrene. And dry gangrene. First let's discuss about wet gangrene. In wet gangrene, the necrotic focus gets infected by putrefactive anaerobic bacteria. Very low oxygen content in dead tissue facilitates anaerobic bacterial growth. There is oozing from the necrotic area due to extensive liquefaction and edema and foul smell due to the production of nitrogenous compounds like cadaverine and putrescine. And black discoloration occurs due to sulfur deposition. Wet gangrene does not develop in every necrotic tissue. It develops in necrotic areas where anaerobic bacteria could access. For example, wet gangrene in limbs is caused by the inerids coming from soil. In perineum, by the perineal commensal flora. And in the intestines, by the intestinal commensal flora. Most often, the infection is a mixed anaerobic growth with Clostridium species and others like anaerobic streptococci, bacteroids, and fusobacterium. Once established in the necrotic focus, these organisms can invade the surrounding viable tissue and spread, even causing septicemia. Removal of the affected body part is mandatory to prevent such complications. These are some images of wet gangrene. Wet gangrene is most commonly seen in lower limbs of the patients with peripheral vascular disease, especially in diabetic patients. In addition, wet gangrene occurs in tissues following extensive crush injuries like road traffic accidents and warfare injuries, neglected bed sores, and necrosis of intestines due to intussusception, strangulated hernia, and intestinal volvulus. Gas gangrene is a special type of wet gangrene caused by clostridial organisms, most commonly by clostridium perfringens infection in deep soft tissue and muscle. Gas gangrene producing organisms are particularly virulent and can spread rapidly into deep tissue planes and cause septicemia. There is increased production of gases which accumulate within the tissue planes, giving rise to a crackling sound when pressed on it. The affected area becomes purple-black in color and foul odor may not be prominent commonly seen in warfare injuries, snake bites, septic abortions, and due to the use of black tar heroin. Here is an image showing an area of gas gangrene. Dry gangrene is different from wet gangrene, and there is no super-added infection. It develops as a manifestation of gradual desiccation of tissues supplied with end arteries, subjected to low-grade ischemia over a long period of time most commonly occurs in extremities of patients who suffer from long-standing peripheral vascular disease. 
presence of low level of oxygen in tissue prevents anaerobic bacterial growth. The dead tissue ultimately falls off and does not spread. This is not a medical emergency like wet gangrene. Now let's see some clinical manifestations of necrosis. Necrosis of an epithelial surface results in an ulcer. Necrosis of myocardial tissue after a myocardial infarction causes reduction in contractility of the heart and even heart failure. Necrosis of cerebral tissue after a cerebral infarction gives rise to neurological defects. Acute tubular necrosis of kidney may cause renal failure. Systemic effects may occur due to inflammation in the surrounding tissue, including high ESR, fever, and high C-reactive protein levels. Local effects may include pain and edema. Now let's discuss about apoptosis. It is a mechanism by which cells die due to activation of an inbuilt death program. Hence, it is also called program cell death. Unlike necrosis, apoptosis is a physiological mechanism of cell death. However, inappropriate apoptosis may lead to diseases. Now let's see some examples for apoptosis which occurs in physiological situations. During embryogenesis, shaping of organs and body parts occur due to apoptosis. Hormone-induced tissue involution, such as involution of mammary tissue after breastfeeding and menopause occurs due to apoptosis. Getting rid of cells with genetic damage during cell division also enabled by apoptosis. At the start of menstruation, sloughing off of the uterine endometrium occurs by apoptosis. And, removal of unwanted autoreactive immune cells, also enabled by apoptosis. Morphological changes in apoptosis are different from necrosis. This is an image from Robin's textbook of pathology. In the left side you can see a normal cell which undergoes cell injury and death by necrosis. In the right side, you can see a cell undergoes death by apoptosis. In apoptosis, due to chromatin condensation and cell shrinkage, the cell becomes round to oval in shape, and cellular organelles get tightly packed. Then the cell breaks up into fragments, called apoptotic bodies, which contain portions of cytoplasm and nucleus. Ultimately, these apoptotic bodies are phagocytized by phagocytic cells. Here is another image showing the stages of apoptosis of a normal cell. In contrast to necrosis, in apoptosis the cell membrane is intact, and no leakage of cellular contents outside. Therefore, in apoptosis there is no associated inflammation. Thus, apoptosis is a silent process with minimal secondary consequences to the host. And unlike necrosis, which is an energy-independent process, apoptosis is an energy-dependent process. Now let's discuss about the molecular mechanism of apoptosis. There are two major pathways. Intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway. Caspases are a class of proteases which kills the cell by breakdown of essential proteins during apoptosis. More than 10 subtypes of caspases have been identified. Some of them, like caspases 8, 9, and 10 are involved in initiation of apoptosis. And some of them, like caspases 3, 6, and 7, are involved in execution of death order by destroying essential proteins within the cell. First let's discuss about the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. This pathway is also known as the mitochondrial pathway. This pathway of apoptosis is the result of increased mitochondrial permeability and release of pro-apoptotic molecules into the cytoplasm. The major one is cytochrome C. In normal cells, the release of these mitochondrial proteins is controlled by a finely coordinated balance between pro- and anti-apoptotic molecules, which belong to the BCL family of proteins. Growth factors and other survival signals stimulate production of anti-apoptotic proteins, the main ones being BCL2, BCLX, and MCL1. These proteins normally reside in the cytoplasm and mitochondrial membranes, where they control the mitochondrial permeability and prevent leakage of death inducers into the cytoplasm. Here is a diagrammatic representation of the function of anti-apoptotic proteins. Lack of survival signals in cellular insults like DNA damage and oxidative stress may cause activation of stress sensors. These sensors are also members of BCL family, 
and they include proteins called BIM, BID, and BAD. These proteins are collectively known as BH3-only proteins. These sensors in turn activate two critical apoptotic effectors, BACs and BAC, which form oligomers that insert into the mitochondrial membrane and create channels that allow proteins from inner mitochondrial membrane to leak out into the cytoplasm. BH3-only proteins may also bind to and block the function of BCL2 and BCLX. At the same time, the synthesis of BCL2 and BCLX may decline. This will impair the anti-apoptotic function of mitochondria and cause leakage of mitochondrial proteins. Once released into the cytoplasm, cytochrome C binds to a protein called apoptosis activating factor 1 and forms a wheel-like hexamer called an apoptosome. This complex is able to bind and activate Caspis 9, the critical initiator Caspis of the mitochondrial pathway. Caspis 9 causes activation of executor Caspis 3 and 7. Then the cell undergoes apoptosis due to the destruction of intracellular proteins. Now let's discuss about the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis. This pathway is also known as the death receptor pathway. In this pathway, the death signal comes from the outside of the cell, and there are transmembrane death receptors on the cell surface to receive these signals. Death receptors are members of tumor necrosis factor receptor family that contain a cytoplasmic domain involved in protein-protein interactions. That is called death domain. The major type of death receptors is called FAS, and the ligand for FAS is expressed on the surface of T cells. In the first step, FAS ligand binds with its receptor. Then, three or more molecules of FAS are brought together, and their cytoplasmic death domains form a binding site for an adapter protein called FAS-associated death domain. This causes formation of active initiator Caspis 8 from its inactive form. In humans, it is Caspis 10. Then the initiator Caspis activates executioner Caspises and induces apoptosis.